All right. Coming up next, I am so honored, so excited to introduce a brand new speaker to the Odd Salon stage. No stranger to the stories of Arctic exploration. A Dutonian, for those of you here, my dear friend, Muriel Gordon. Let's just get this mic adjusted. Well, that's pretty good. We're similar sized. Yeah. Hi. Tonight, I am going to tell all of you about the Swede S.A. Andres Arctic Hydrogen Balloon Expedition. You heard that correctly. <laughs> Our story begins in Svalbard in 1897. Svalbard is a little cluster of islands midway between Norway and the North Pole. S.A. Andre, a Swedish engineer and balloonist, is prepping for a daring journey to the pole by hydrogen balloon. He hopes to be the first to reach it. His expedition is funded in part by Alfred Nobel and the King of Sweden. What you see in front of you is the house he had built to house the balloon while it was being filled. It was five stories high with a felted wool interior and gelatin windows. The idea being nothing in the interior of the house can pop the balloon. Isn't that satisfying, that realization? Now, you know that house smelled absolutely disgusting. <laughs> the balloon launched on July 11th, 1897, after waiting anxiously for a favorable wind to take them north. Conditions when they left, not great. But they had to go. You can see part of Andre's unique design for his balloon, it included drag ropes and a sail, the idea being he could steer the balloon, he wasn't just subject to winds. You're probably also noticing that the drag ropes dragged ass. <laughs> Within sight of the launch pad, the drag ropes accidentally dislodged, and Andre and company were forced to continue their journey without the ability to steer like any other nobody schmuck balloon. The balloon stayed aloft for three days, traveling 300 miles from the launch pad, another 300 from the pole, so halfway. Not bad. They then spent the next three months sledging over pack ice. Yeah. First trying to reach the pole, then just trying to find land. Now, sledging is a miserable, exhausting way to get around. It's also very, very dangerous. They constantly were falling into recessed pools of water, and by the way, below freezing temperatures. They were near starvation almost throughout the journey, and they avoided starvation through sheer luck. They were always cold and tired. At one point in this journey, they were subsisting on algae soup and polar bear blood pancakes. <laughs> they finally found land in Kvitvia, which is very near the longitude of where they started and frustratingly close to safety. They died there three weeks later. Spoiler alert, spoiler alert, they died. Sorry, I'm sorry. I told you early so you wouldn't be, you know, invested. They probably died from cold and exhaustion. We're not really sure, but that seems the most likely reason. So why would anyone make such an obviously dangerous and potentially fatal trip? The North Pole at this time was one of the very last complete unknowns. We didn't know if it was solid earth, polar ice, a warm tropical sea. Some people thought it was a big pit with a whole other world nestled underneath ours. <laughs> Maybe. We had no idea what the hell was going on up there, but a lot of people were willing to die to find out. By the 20th century, of the over 1,000 people who went to find it, 751 of them died. But to really understand what polar exploration is like, I think it helps to hear some stories about it. The main attractions of polar travel are starvation, near mutiny, 
executions to quell said mutinies, frostbite, insanity, and death. On a scientific expedition in the 1880s in the Canadian Arctic, one guy got frostbite so bad his whole face froze shut. He couldn't eat, speak, or open his eyes for several days. By the time the rescue ship showed up, many months later, by the way, his extremities had fallen off, and the warmer temperature on the ship caused his wounds to thaw. All the germs that had been dormant in the cold woke up, and he died on the ride home. <laughs> Mm -hmm. yeah. One guy who arguably did all the things correctly still had a really shitty time of it. This dreamy hunk of Ludafisk <laughs> is Norwegian explorer Fritjof Nansen. He left for the pole a few years before Andre and got closer to it than any of his contemporaries. He planned his trip obsessively, perfecting hundreds of years of polar exploration, and he still nearly starved to death. So that begs the question, what kind of a person wants to put up with this kind of bullshit to go look at the top of the earth? I present to you, Solomon Auguste Andre. Mm. My man Andre graduated from Sweden's Royal Institute of Technology with a degree in engineering. He participated in the first International Polar Year, a scientific summit lasting several months with 11 countries participating. His contributions were excellent, so good in fact, that because of them, the Swedish delegation's work was considered the best of all the participating countries. He became interested in ballooning as a young man and then patiently waited about 30 years before he ever set foot in a balloon. Now this guy wasn't some wealthy weirdo who had a bunch of money to just throw at whatever struck his fancy. He was a really ordinary guy, but his compelling personality and his skill at public speaking resulted in him having all of the expenses for all of his ballooning stuff over about a decade paid for by public and private donors. I mentioned King of Sweden, Alfred Nobel at the top of the hour, talk, whatever. They helped fund his trip. Not a bad deal, right? I'm sure it didn't hurt that people thought he was pretty banging. <laughs> He was described as heroic looking and one of the handsomer men in Sweden with a Herculean frame. That right there is what made monocles pop and bosoms heave in 1890. Andre was also someone who was really great at keeping his emotions at arm's length. When Andre was 16, His dad died. This only deepened his already considerable attachment to his mother. As an adult, Andre eschewed romance because he didn't want to negatively impact his relationship with his mom. And because he didn't want a weepy scene with a woman not, like, begging him to not go off ballooning. <laughs> kind of stuff I would tell people in high school when they were like, why don't you have a boyfriend? I was just so busy ballooning, you know? <laughs> that was why. I don't know what his deal actually was. Hmm. So would everybody in 1890. But I do know what a tenuous excuse sounds like. When his mother died a few months before his trip, he didn't let on how much this affected him, but in private writing, he admitted that it made him kind of lose his will to live. Now, Scandinavians, as I know from my own family and from the documentary feature film, Frozen, <laughs> 
live by the mantra of conceal, don't feel. <laughs> Don't let them know. <laughs> so I personally don't find his refusal to share his feelings all that surprising. But I do think, I do think that mindset helps you disregard others' input when you have a dumb idea, like a hydrogen balloon trip to the North Pole. I think it also helps you risk your life for a higher cause. So we get the setting. We get Andre. Your next question is probably why a balloon? Well, keep in mind that the Wright brothers' first really successful flight was about 10 years out, and they only went about 30 miles, so I think it's safe to say that airplanes off the table for this particular trip. Another option was ship. But they can't get very far in the pack ice. You can also dog sled, which is difficult. It takes a lot of expertise, and it still fucking sucks. Now, this image, just as an aside, I found this randomly when I was Google image searching for this talk, and it is the best thing I've ever seen. And I think it's much funnier to not explain what this is to any of you and just let you look at it for a little bit. There are two versions of this object in the world, by the way. This isn't the only one. Your other option for Arctic travel is to use your own human feet to pull a sledge, which, as we've discussed, is, is the worst. You remember the main attractions of polar travel. <laughs> Andre, like you, was not stoked on this, and he hoped that by getting airborne he could take a small party, float over all of the bullshit, and get the trip done in a fraction of the time it would have taken on land. Not a bad idea, right? He hoped to be aloft for 30 days, landing somewhere. And then he would somehow make his way back home. <laughs> if this plan sounds vague to you, that's because it was. Which brings me to why he failed. So something to keep in mind about hydrogen balloons at this time is you fill them right before you leave, and when you're in the air, you can't replenish the supply of gas. So you have one shot, and you best hope your shit sticks the first time around. The sledges they brought with them on this trip were between 300 and 400 pounds, and the maximum recommended sledge weight is under 200. That's a lot of weight. Another thing to keep in mind, Andre and company were not Arctic explorers. None of them had traveled in the Arctic, and they sure as shit didn't train for that before they left. <laughs> they believed so firmly in their balloon, in their theory, that they didn't do any worst case scenario planning. Most importantly though, Andre's idea was a major departure from the norm. There were a lot of unknown variables on this trip. He tried something totally wild, and that has a tendency to backfire spectacularly when it goes wrong. Andre and his companion's remains were discovered in 1930, a little over 30 years after they disappeared. They were found by a Norwegian scientific and sealing team. The remains were taken to Tromsø, where an enormous funeral was held. Now, Andre was a pretty big celebrity before leaving. His idea was daring, and it captured the heart of the world. They were all rooting for him. And public interest only deepened with his mysterious disappearance. At his funeral, the preacher said, many had said that it was a madman's journey to travel over the ice northwards in a balloon. It was possible that these men had been urged by some slight touch of human vanity, but innermost there lay an ideal craving to explore a world. They were the first who had endeavored to penetrate the regions of the Arctic by the air. Others had succeeded them with better results. But if no one had ventured to take the first dangerous step, these later results would never have been obtained. Sweden may be proud of having owned these men who had not quailed before their task. I think it's very easy when viewing it from a modern perspective to see Andre's expedition as ridiculous. I know I did when I first started researching it. 
we have methods of transportation now that would have seemed like science fiction in Andre's time. To the modern person, the hydrogen balloon is a ridiculous way to get around, and in retrospect, it's obvious it's a bad way to get to the North Pole. But in Andre's time, we didn't know that because no one had ever tried it. An inventive idea is obvious only in retrospect, and every big breakthrough seems ridiculous until someone succeeds. So here's to Andre. And to everyone else, whether they succeeded or failed, who is brave enough to try something a little bit crazy. Y'all can standing ovation. That was incredible. That was Muriel's first talk.